All right. Uh, I can see that the audience is much more relaxed than previous talk. Half of you have beers inside uh, in your hands, so that's good. Uh, my name is Hubert. Uh, I live in Bewistock. I run small consultancy slash software house slash whatever you call it. Uh, we mostly work with Ruby, uh, but about a year ago we started work working with Elixir. We pushed two projects with Elixir to production already. Uh, we work on the third project at the moment. Um, that's the stuff I'm going to be talking about to you. And uh, we also have multiple pl Elixir projects in the pipeline. So for those of you who wonder whether there's a market for Elixir projects, uh, there is. Uh, the, the, the question is how to find customers, but that's probably a topic for other uh, talk uh, on, its, on its own. Uh, today, we're going to focus on CQRS, since uh, we recently implemented that in Elixir, because uh, you know, we figured a new language, a new framework, you know, that's not enough, let's do new architecture, so make it exciting and difficult. Uh, and we succeeded in making that exciting and difficult, uh, definitely. Um, so, what is CQRS? Uh, this acronym stands for Command Query Responsibility Segregation, and it's Architectural Design Pattern. Uh, so, design pattern that allows you to structure your applications in, 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 in specific way. Uh, to basically separate responsibility of commands and queries. <laughs> uh, no, but seriously, uh, it's a it's a serious serious design pattern. Uh, first introduced by a guy called Greg Young, but then multiple books emerged uh, about the subject. The subject is quite popular among uh, .NET, Java, uh, also recently Ruby developers. Uh, there are. Uh, there are many, multiple implementations, actually not so many frameworks to implement this, uh, this pattern, but uh, I should move? Okay, cool. Uh, but more of uh, implementations. Uh, every single system probably uh, has slightly different implementation of CQRS, and that's mostly up to you to interpret you, it's in, uh, this design pattern in your own way, which is nice. Um, the thing is, you probably don't need to do all of this, uh, and if you really think you you do need to use CQRS in application, well, go to step one. You probably don't. So, so, uh, so the reason for that is is because it's quite labor intense uh, and re results in larger amount of code to produce and larger amount of code to maintain. But not just code. The, the only worse thing than legacy code is legacy data, and CQRS uh, results in streams of events that basically get preserved somewhere in some stream in database or whatever. And this is your obligation to remember about those legacy events if you ever want to replay those events, um, and your application, for example, changes. So I, I would definitely. Uh, discourage you from using CQRS in uh, in applications that evolve uh, very rapidly or change their direction very rapidly. Um, yeah, so that's the thing. But uh, you might find it very much useful for parts of your application, and and that's that's the uh, that's the that's the that's the way forward that we're going with an app. We started building it a uh, whole full-featured CQRS from uh, every single feature, but then we figured, okay, we don't really need that. We just need it for the core stuff, uh, and that's what we're doing. Right. Um, let's talk about commands and queries and how we actually treat those. Uh, you know, the design pattern is up to you. Uh, for us, the there are two sorts of operations that, that can happen within the application. One is command, the other one is query. And it's simple as that. Commands uh, are the things that introduce changes to the system. So whenever you, as 
a user of application, or you as an external system, or you as different actor that's you know different part of the same app, you want to introduce change to the system, you basically issue a command. You generate a command and you serve, send it to a dedicated endpoint. Wherever you want to uh, get some information from the system, uh, get the state of the system, uh, render some page or whatever, you issue queries. And those are our, this is our interface. Basically, we have uh, commands that have name and a payload, uh, and we have queries that also have name and a payload. A and we don't really build any other API. We just have two plugs exposed, which are like uh, simple controllers. One is accepting commands, the other one is accepting queries, gets the uh, command name, uh, finds appropriate uh, uh, aggregate that I'm going to talk about a bit, a bit later, sends the command over to be executed, and is done with it. Mm. The same with queries. Of course, uh, you could build an API on top of commands and queries uh, that uh, abstracts that if you don't like. We actually do, but you might not. Uh, in our case, uh, the web interface, uh, which is a Phoenix app, uh, contacts our uh, another application running in the same uh, Erlang VM uh, through the commands and queries, but there's nothing stopping you from uh, putting one more layer, you know, we like to layer stuff as programmers. Okay. Um, CQRS comes from the whole world of domain driven design. So, to understand CQRS, you probably need some knowledge of domain driven design and terms that are being used over there. Uh, stuff like event sourcing. So, uh, you know, something in a system generates some events, they're being stored to some stream, something else in the system consumes those events, like a pub sap or whatever. Uh, you, you are gonna build your domain model for your problem. And I mean like, a, in our case, uh, it's a proper domain model in terms of uh, things running on the virtual machine that represent things that they actually need to represent. For example, uh, if we have a banking system where the users have their bank accounts, we have something called account uh, for one user, another thing called account for another user, etc., etc. Uh, as you can imagine in, uh, in Elixir, in Erlang, those things can easily be processes and that's what they are. So uh, we model our domain in, in this way. Uh, and we try to use the language that the customer is using to describe the problem. Uh, aggregates in bounded context, another term that, that's probably familiar for, for, for most of us from domain-driven design is, uh, you know, those things that perform some operation within given context. <laughs> uh, that's quite... Uh, difficult concept to grasp, but basically uh, you, you need to think quite a lot on how you divide your application to aggregates and, and what are your contexts are uh, so that you actually design uh, your app good from the start. That's another negative effect of using CQRS or domain-driven design. That, that you need to really think hard about those those things to, to, to figure out what they should be. Um, all right, so sum up. Uh, building blocks, we have commands and queries. Uh, we have streams of events. We have those aggregates that we discussed are processes representing things. Uh, they execute some event handlers. They have event handlers inside. The other thing which I didn't talk about, uh, that's in CQRS, on the side from your uh, domain model is your read model. So you basically need to maintain two models. One model is your domain model. This is the state and interactions of your application. And the read model is something that you query. So 
for example, if you're building a web app, your read model is something that your query is going to hit if they want to, want to render a website. Uh, so they're not going to hit uh, your domain model to, to output pages when you do get requests. They're going to hit the read model. And, and, and um, your domain model probably not going to be a database. It's going to be objects, classes, and uh, uh, states they have. Uh, while your read model can very much likely be database, and moreover, that's going to be, uh, if you want, the normalized database. There's nothing stopping you from doing that. All right. So let's talk about the commands and, and life cycle of the command. Uh, first of all, the command is being issued by something. Uh, in our case, React uh, web application, uh, front-end application. Uh, it lands on a plug. The plug, uh, the plug actually does, okay, so we have two layers of validations. Uh, first of all, we validate uh, whether the payload, so the data sent over with a command, uh, makes sense. Uh, for example, whether the types are correct or the string's length doesn't exceed something or, uh, you know, format of email, stuff like that. So this is non-business logic validation that is really fast and can be performed concurrently. We just do it in a plug, okay? And then if that if that if the, those validations are not met, we just output error straight away. Nothing hits our aggregates. Nothing, nothing is being uh, executed blocking other functions of the system. Nothing hits database. Uh, okay, but let's say we validated the uh, command uh, and said, okay, this is, looks like a valid command. Uh, then our command router finds an aggregate uh, that this uh, command basically applies to. Uh, I'm going to be talking about aggregates in a second, but, but basically this command is being sent over to a process that's responsible for handling this command. And the second layer of validation applies. This is where you validate your business logic. So uh, each aggregate uh, validates the commands one after another. Uh, so only one validation happens at a time. Uh, it's, it's sort of like uh, uh, application level transactions. You know, you have multiple aggregates. So for example, if your domain is, is like, again, bank accounts, you have multiple bank accounts for different users. Uh, many uh, commands can be happening at the same time, but only one command will be validated and executed for, uh, for this particular bank account, uh, which, uh, which, which, for example, protects us from, from stuff like, okay, two things are gonna happening at the same time, so uh, like, I don't know, email uh, uniqueness validation. Uh, you can ensure that on the application level that this email is gonna be unique because nothing else is gonna update it uh, at the same time. All right, so uh, command is being uh, dispatched to an aggregate. Aggregate performs this business rules validation, for example, bank win transfer or withdraw of amount of money. We're gonna check whether the balance, remaining balance uh, on the account is still positive and only allow uh, the commands to proceed if that's the case. Uh, if not, we're gonna return the same errors to the user as we would uh, in the first validation. So the uh, client side application uh, gets exactly the same format of the response. But it, if, it, uh, if, the com if the command is being validated properly, which should be in most cases, uh, then the command emits uh, events. So the command uh, is not doing any database updates. It's not doing any state updates on the aggregate. It only emits the events, and the events at this stage are being persisted. Uh, we're not doing anything fancy at the moment. We just store those uh, events to, uh, to Postgres, uh, and command basically finishes. Um, on the other hand, while you know life cycle of commands is quite complex, 
and maybe difficult to get grasps on. Life cycle of queries is easy. You just, uh, something issues a query, uh, the payload is already also validated. Uh, query is the read model, which in our case is Postgres database. Uh, we use Ecto uh, as well in, in a very simple way where we just, uh, you know, have some selects and it outputs some data. Then this data is being serialized with Python and uh, sent over to the user. Um, and, you know, there's nothing special about the queries. But an aggregate, an aggregate is really important piece of the whole puzzle. Uh, this is the place, this is the thing that um, in most CQRS implementations, you would have like an object, instances of objects, then probably they would have, uh, there would be like an aggregate route uh, where they reference other aggregates. Uh, in Elixir and Erlang, uh, we don't have objects. So what do we do? Uh, instead of objects, we have uh, processes. And more specifically, we have GenServer, which is a process that responds to, uh, to calls, you can call it, and it also maintains internal state. So we figured, okay, that's basically what we need because, because we need something that responds to calls, we can call it and get some data from it, uh, make it do some work for us, and it also, also should persist, uh, some, preserve some state. Uh, so um, we actually lazily load those aggregates. Whenever uh, the command comes that references the bank account number 602, uh, we, uh, we initialize the aggregate for this account uh, number 602 or whatever I said. Um, unless it's running. Uh, if we already started it uh, within the application, then we don't really have to start it again. We just return it immediately. Um, first thing that we have to do once the aggregate is being started is we have to recreate its state. Uh, in CQRS, uh, the source of uh, all truth are the streams of the events. So our, your events are the most important thing. And we actually recreate the state of the aggregate by applying one by one event uh, onto the aggregate. So, so rep replay of all past events is the first step. Um, this part can definitely be optimized further by doing snapshots and just basically restoring from snapshots from something like the ETS tables. Uh, we're not doing that just yet. Um, all right, so the aggregate started, it's running, it's gen server, uh, and it waits for the command. Command is being dispatched, command is being validated, commands trigger some events. Those events go to the store, store sends back those events to the aggregate, and aggregate uh, has the event handlers, which are basically um, handle call functions with a pattern matching inside to, to figure out what event we're gonna handle. And they there can be actually three types of those event handlers. Uh, first type is those event handlers uh, that update internal state of the aggregate. So, for example, if we made a top up to our account, uh, this command top up our account with uh, $100 would emit something like uh, an account topped up event uh, with an amount. Uh, and one event handler would basically uh, update internal state of the aggregate, uh, just, you know, set new state with uh, added amount. Uh, the other one would update um, read model, so the stuff that queries read, so a database, somewhere there's, you know, like a mirror of our domain model to be queried, uh, and it needs to be updated, so we need an event handler to do that. Um, the first type of event handlers are those that communicate with external systems. Most likely, I don't know, send an email or whatever. Um, so those event handlers need to be executed as well. Right, I already said that. Events, 
events are the most important thing in the system. They allow you to go back in time. They, they, they can be replayed when the, when the system is started, when the aggregate is being uh, started, and they need to be replayed in, in some cases. So as a rule of thumb, uh, every command that succeeded, it should emit one plus events. Um, so that we keep a track of whatever is happening in the system. Um, events populate the aggregate state. They also populate the read model. Um, commands business logic, so the important stuff, runs with an aggregate, with an access to aggregate state. And whatever new events are uh, emitted by command, they are appended. Uh, I don't know what I was going to say here. Anyway. Um, Aggregates are actually pretty important. At first, we uh, we figured in the very first iteration, okay, uh, we don't have objects, we, we don't really need aggregates, but, but, but sooner rather than later, we figured we not only need this uh, application level transactions, but we also need to preserve the state somewhere in the memory. So, so, uh, so we did just that. All right, I think I already said that. Uh, okay, yes, an example. Um, all right, uh, so aggregates and event handlers are pretty pretty easy. They're just a gen server, nothing special about that. Uh, what we had to implement in our user's wallet system, bank account system, is actually a way to initialize those aggregates when we need those or create those aggregates when the new command comes in. Uh, and this is where it actually turned out to be really easy. I figured, okay, that's going to be a pain in the ass to implement, but no, Elixir is great, so it builds on top of Erlang even better, uh, uh, where we actually have stuff like uh, supervisors, and you can build your own supervisors. Uh, if you want to know how, just have a look at the supervisors directory in Elixir uh, source code. Most of Elixir is written in Elixir, <laughs> really easy to read once you know basics of Elixir. Um, so, uh, so we built something that uh, that does that. Uh, blah 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 blah. Right. Uh, there's a. If you want to build a supervisor, uh, there are a few strategies that that uh, um, Erlang implements by default. Whenever you want to build a supervisor that you can dynamically add or remove children to, so the process is the supervisor. Uh, um, supervises, uh, so the strategy you want to use is simple one for one, most likely. And how does it work is that, that, that you basically um, um, have a supervisor that has a template uh, for its children, and one child is being provided to the supervisor at start, and, and it's like it clones it uh, whenever you need a new, new child. That, that's basically what's, what's, what's happening. Um, so in our case, in CQRS, we don't have one supervisor that supervises all of our aggregates. Instead, we have individual supervisors for each class of an aggregate. For example, uh, if it's a bank account, we're going to have bank account supervisors that supervise all the bank accounts in the system uh, and starts new bank accounts whenever the command comes in that references new one. Uh, and another one to handle, uh, I don't know, accounts in the system or uh, whatever other aggregates you, you might have. Uh, so something like, like that. Uh, I'm sure that's readable. Uh, but basically, in your application callback, uh, module, uh, so the thing that starts your application uh, supervision tree, you just define uh, what aggregates you're going to have by defining what uh, supervisors uh, uh, you want to start. You give it a name, uh, and this aggregate supervisor, uh, you know, it, it can figure out by that name what should be the name of the aggregate. Uh, module that's the gen server, it, it, it's starting. And it, once you need a new aggregate, it just spawns new aggregate for you, uh, reapplies the commands one by one, 
and returns the, the thing to you, the PID of the uh, of the aggregate to 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 your to your your code. Uh, so we don't really need objects, although most of CQRS implementations are in object-oriented languages like C# -sharp or Java or Ruby or whatever. I think they're also in Node. So uh, anyway, uh, you don't really need objects. Elixir slash Erlang they give you uh, better abstractions than objects in 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 form of uh, processes, gen servers, supervisors, trees of processes, etc. Um, in my experience, CQRS is all about proper handling of state. So handling the state within the aggregates and actually figuring out what the aggregates are is the most important part. If you don't do that properly, then you're gonna run into trouble. Right, gen servers, that's ready to use aggregate. Although, uh, I know there's a guy, Andre, who probably is not here. Uh, uh, we had a talk uh, like last week or two weeks ago. He's also implementing CQRS in Elixir, and he's building something, a library called, uh, I think his code name is Gen Aggregate. So I'm really looking forward to seeing his code uh, to compare the implementations, uh, because for us, Gen Server works good enough. Um, again, word of warning, don't choose CQRS, if you like what you saw, just because you like what you saw, uh, you really need to have solid case for CQRS to justify extra effort um, that it's gonna take. Um, if you need to uh, learn more about that, there are other people doing that, either in Erlang or in Elixir. Uh, I'm gonna send over this to, uh, I already did, to, to organizers, uh, and probably you can find it online as well. Uh, there's a guy called Brian Hunter, I believe, and he's giving this talk, talks about uh, CQRS in Erlang, which are fantastic, and he provides a, a source code to, uh, on his GitHub account uh, of some uh, sample implementation. So if you know a little bit of Erlang, uh, that's a good, place to start. There's another guy who's, who, who describes his macro-based approach to CQRS in Elixir. Uh, I personally think the usage of macros should be limited, so our approach is uh, not macro-based. <laughs> um, and yeah, thank you. Any questions? Uh, uh, thanks a lot. I really like uh, how you stressed both the advantages and drawbacks of this approach. This is where normally people just, eh, hey, it's cool, use it. Uh, so that's that's wisdom. Uh, the question is, uh, are you aware of Datomic database for closure and is there anything remotely close in uh, Elixir? Uh, I don't know. I I'm not as aware. <laughs> I don't know. That's a good question. I don't know. Okay, thanks. <laughs> Um, my question is um, how you pass data between uh, data model and uh, read model. Are you, you, you doing it at the application level? At the, uh, are you using some kind of uh, queue, like 0MQ or RabbitMQ, or are you using at the database level when you're you know, triggering events when something is put on to the Postgres, for example? Uh, Okay, so probably what you're thinking about is delaying that updates to the read model. Yes, 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 exactly. We're not doing that at the moment. Uh, I know we, uh, it would be beneficial uh, to do so, and we're definitely thinking about doing that, but at the moment we're not doing that. So, so all of the uh, updates are synchronously handled. Okay, from the application? From, from the application, yes. Okay. And events in the application, when you you have a handler and the handler is doing some work based on some events, the events are passing between parts of the application at the application level itself, like using processes and feeds, right? Or are you using like, let's say, once again, some kind of queue? That was the first approach. So, 
second approach. Uh, once that we built using something like GProc, where we registered those uh, event handlers, but in the end we figured we all we actually need are the aggregates, and uh, all of the event handlers are triggered from the aggregate. So there's never event handler that's not being connected for the aggregate. So, so uh, when, a when a command comes in, uh, first it uses the supervisors. So, so first it figures out which supervisor should it ask for an aggregate, then the supervisor returns basically the, the aggregate it needs, and the command is passed there, passed there, and then nothing leaves the aggregate. So there are no event handlers uh, listening somewhere else within the application uh, for the changes. That that would be breaking this bounded context constraint on the aggregate. Okay, thank you. Uh, you said that you built a couple of applications in Elixir. What was the biggest problems you saw? Of what was the biggest problem? There were quite a few, actually. So, so I'm not gonna be one of the super uh, super happy uh, about everything, and you know what I'm telling you is the source of all truth. Uh, there's definitely problems on uh, the amount of uh, libraries support for even commercial monitoring tools. They don't come with uh, agents for Elixir and stuff like that. So uh, there's different mindset involved in building and deploying Elixir apps. Stuff like, for example, if, you, if you're used to using Heroku, that's not even good platform to deploy Elixir apps because you're gonna cut yourself off from the most interesting parts of the Erlang ecosystem if you do that. Uh, so there's definitely mind shift problems uh, that, that you have to overcome yourself. Uh, tooling is actually good. So I, I don't have any complaints about the tooling. So libraries, mind shift, uh, yeah. The, the, the first one, you cannot jump around. The second one, you can by hard work. Okay, thanks. So you start your aggregates lazily. Do you ever like unload them? No, uh, we're thinking about it. I think, I think there are, uh, multiple ways of doing that. You can use the hibernate uh, process. You can just hibernate those processes and then uh, get them back. But you also can serialize. We're, we're, more, we're more thinking about the snapshots, like snapshot the state to the ETS tables and uh, uh, then recover it afterwards. Uh, we haven't decided yet how to handle it. So you said that Heroku is not the best uh, hosting platform. So what is the best one, or at least good one, maybe? Oh, uh, what do you use? Well, basically anything that you can run your Elixir uh, cluster on and uh, have an access to file system, because some things like Nisia or, or you know those those DETS tables they sometimes need to be stored somewhere on the disk. Uh, so whatever gives you access to file system and allow you to open ports again. Like for example, um, Elixir and Erlang, it can be clustered uh, and it requires opening custom ports so those two instances, they can share some things between each other and Heroku won't allow you to do that. All you can open up is the port 80 uh, to listen to. Uh, that's it. So. so AWS, EC2, uh, DigitalOcean, Hetzner, whatever. Uh, so you've said, uh, don't use it, then you don't need it. Would you use it again if you like start from scratch? Could I use what? what? Let's see QRS. To, to Could you to use this, this architecture? Or would you consider something else? Uh, I'm gonna definitely pick up pieces of it, and it's a good learning experience. Like for example, 
uh, I believe now on, most of my uh, service objects in Ruby or service modules in Elixir are gonna be either queries or commands in that form. Because wow. whatever I'm, I'm gonna do uh, secrets under the hood, it doesn't really matter. I like the interface. Anyone else? Okay, so that's it. Thank you very much and Thank you. Thank you.